the Teach Pitch podcast. We are very excited to be launching a series of interviews for Teach Pitch, a global community of tens of thousands of subscribers from over 205 countries who all have a desire to improve the state of education in this world. And for these interviews, we have selected a number of our subscribers who have achieved great things. And by great, I mean amazing. Think of former presidents, entrepreneurs, fashion designers, hospital builders, nonprofit founders, authors, journalists, doctors, etc. And what all our guests have in common is that despite their great success, they've encountered many enormous challenges. So what were these challenges and how did they overcome them? That is what we are going to be talking about here. My name is Alder Pap and I'm massively looking forward and very grateful you can join us on this journey. So sit back, relax, and download the podcast here. Um, Pamela De Palma, a publicist, flew me to California to do a photo shoot with, with Camilla. And I was in her bathroom getting her ready. And who walks in but Matthew McConaughey and asked for a haircut. And, yeah. you know, I, all right, all right, all right. No, I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, obviously he sat in the chair and, and the very next week I was flying to Europe with him and it, it changed oh, wow. like that. It changed my career. A very warm welcome. So happy you could make it to another episode of the Teach Pitch podcast. And today we are glamming it up as we are taking you to Hollywood. In our continuous search for the world's most unique jobs and careers, I think we surely found a diamond today as I had the great honor and pleasure to interview Kristen Serafino. Now, Kristen is a hairstylist and not just your regular one. Throughout her 20 plus year career, she has been responsible for the looks of actors like Matthew McConaughey, Robert Pattinson, Jake Gyllenhaal, Daniel Craig, Sean Mendes, Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman, Michael J. Fox, and this list just goes on and on and on and on. Next to being a genius with coiffure, she's also the most lovely and hardworking person you have ever met. Kristen even took the time to give me lots of good tips and tricks on how to never have a bad hair day. And I am working with her tips each and every day now. Can you imagine? That's how good she is. She's continuously on the go advising people, uh, whether this is on TV programs like Good Morning America or working with people in her salon. That is if she's not on the road for a film project. Kristen is now devoted to growing her hair paste company called The Best Paste that is winning lots of awards and accolades. And we talked to her about her journey as a CEO, hairstylist, and just an amazing person in general. Special call out to Kristen's chief operating officer, Doug Church, who also gets a mention further on in the interview. Doug, if you're listening, you rock. So without further ado, let's get into a set of new challenges, beautiful hair, great styling tips and tricks, and the amazing glitter and glamour of the movie industry for episode 56 with Kristen Serafino, the Hollywood hairstylist. This podcast is brought to you by Smartest, an app that uses artificial intelligence to let you create interactive quizzes for your class in a few seconds. Get started for free on app.smartest.io. Yes, and we are back with another episode of our Hall of Fame, where we collect people with interesting professions. And when I say interesting, I mean intriguing. I mean professions that really stop us in our tracks. And I think today we caught a beautiful one, really a a beautiful person inside and out. Let me first talk about the job, so we all know what it is about. It is someone who is passionate and in love with hair. It's a hairstylist, but not just any hairstylist. It's a Hollywood hairstylist. And when I say Hollywood hairstylist, I mean someone who works with the biggest Hollywood stars at the moment. Not only that, but but is doing a great job in 
in working in Hollywood, meanwhile also having her own company, her own salon, giving her own advice, and then now also her own paste product. I should stop talking and I should just uh, welcome her, give her the warmest welcome ever. Kristen Serafino, very warm welcome to you. Well, thank you so much. You made me sound so cool. <laughs> I didn't you know are, I was that. You are very cool. You are by <laughs> far one of the coolest guests we've ever had. I feel under cool kind of talking to you because <laughs> you are, you. I mean, we did our research and kind of all the things you've done in the past, all the style advice you are you have given people. I think you did that for, they're not sponsoring us, but I'm going to say it anyways, for Sisley. Uh, is that, do I pronounce it correctly? Yeah, um, Sicily. Yeah. Sicily, you're giving grooming advice to men, right? Around how to look good. But also I've seen video clips on Good Morning America, if I, if I have that correctly, whereby yes. you talk about cutting your hair in general, and that's for male as well as female. Is that true? Yes, yes. I've, I've been very, very fortunate. I mean, I, um, you know, I didn't start this career until I was 30 years old. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I had an entire career and then changed at the age of 30. So I was living a very cushy corporate job and making very good money. I was living in New York City. I had a fabulous apartment, but I was miserable. And I had always wanted to be a hairstylist. My mom was a hairstylist, my uncles, my cousins. And, and my mom, you know, at the age of 18, when I was getting ready to leave for college, I remember walking into the bathroom. This is a funny story. She was applying mascara and looking in the mirror. And uh, I walked in and I said, mommy, I want to be a hairdresser. And she pulled the mascara wand away and she looked over at me and said, over my dead body, you will go to college. Yeah. And I was like, oh. What? What just happened? And we never talked about it again. And it wasn't until years later, what I realized is that it wasn't that she didn't want me to be a hairstylist. She wanted me to have the opportunities and my sister that she never had. So my mom put my dad through college, put him through law school. You know, her, her she never went to college. So she mm -hmm. wanted her daughters to have that experience of an education and not right. just an education. She wanted us to go in the Northeast. Like she was very specific with her goals for her children. So it was truly the best thing she ever did for me because I, I credit so much of my success to my parents and the wisdom that my mom had making my, myself go to college and, mm -hmm. and get my and and working in corporate for 10 years. But at 30, I think she realized, boy, was I miserable. <laughs> so yeah. that, at that point, you know, again, I was making six figures. I had a beautiful apartment in New York City. I had a 401k, a savings account, an IRA. And I said, I'm going to go back to beauty school. I'm going to leave it all. And I'm going to make $6.50 an hour behind a shampoo bowl. And my first year, I made $12,500 went through my IRA, went through my savings account, went through everything. And I was like, I, I decided I'm going to make it in this business. And that's, uh, that's exactly what I did. But I, I really believe it's my education that really gave me the wherewithal and, and the guidance of my family that, that got me to where I am today. That's amazing. There's, there's 17,000 questions I would like to ask you <laughs> on the basis of what you just said. Um, one of them being like, what was it about hair as a young child that you said, like, this is what I want to do? Where did that passion come from? Um, I, you know, it's a really interesting question. I've never been asked that before. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that I necessarily grew up in a salon, because at that point, my mom later on, once my sister was born, um, she was more of a mom, a house mom, or, you know, uh, she was home at that point. But I think that there was this creative energy that I wasn't able to fulfill. And I couldn't find it with what I was doing in sales. Um, I worked in the garment district, so mm -hmm. I couldn't quite find what the passion was. And there was something always drawing me back to hair. And I can remember as there were times in high school when I would cut friends hair, <laughs> which I don't know why they let me, but they would. Mm -hmm. And so it just kind of came back to me later. I, I don't really know why. And it's interesting, no one's ever asked me that question. So that's an excellent question. I would mm -hmm. guess that there was just a creative element in my life that was missing that I sort of found whether I did my own hair or my sister's hair or blow dry my mom's hair, whatever it was, I just loved it. Yeah. Um, and at that time, I had no idea what I was doing, but there was something about it that felt rewarding to me that someone could look in a mirror and see themselves in a way that they didn't before they sat in the chair that I had done their hair. Okay. So I think that there was something there. And yeah. um yeah. So, I mean, the hair is connected to appearance. So there is there is something about other people making them feel good about themselves. And yeah, that you kind that. of, yeah, yeah. I always say it's, it's you know, 
clients in my chair, I call my magic mirror. And that, mm-hmm. you know, it's very interesting because it's, it's really the only time where someone will sit in, a, in front of a mirror for an hour is when yeah. they're getting their hair done. It's my job, I believe, as a hairstylist is that I get to see someone in a way that they don't always see themselves. It's very Mm -hmm. rare that someone sits in a chair and says, I look amazing today before they get their hair done. Mm -hmm. Usually they find everything they don't like about themselves. It's like I've gained weight or I don't like the way my hair looks or I don't feel good or whatever. It may be a life thing. You know, I'm going through a divorce or I'm pregnant, whatever it is. But they Mm -hmm. never look at themselves and say, oh, I feel incredible. So it's usually my job behind the chair that I get to see people in ways that they don't see themselves. Mm -hmm. And then my responsibility as a hairstylist is to, you know, accentuate that hair so that it brings out the confidence within them as people, you know, looking at themselves. So that's sort of what Mm -hmm. I feel like. It's not just I'm cutting hair. I don't see it as that. I think it's more of I have this ability to give someone a confidence that they probably have, but they don't see in themselves. That's really why I think it's just a remarkable job. I mean, I just I love every minute of it. Yeah, well, what comes to mind is that also often if I go to the barber, and by the way, I went this morning because I was like, okay, I, if I'm going to have a conversation with a celebrity hairstylist, one of the best in the world, then my hair better look good. Um, and I did uh, say, the first thing I said was your hair looks really good you today. Did. You did. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much. Um, but but what I notice is that there's a lot of, indeed, it's not only the hair, it's also Like, for instance, the gentleman who was doing my hair, he was showing such care and devotion to my hair on levels that I never personally would have done, right? It's like combing or blow drying something or doing, you know, being very specific with hair in a way that you would never do for yourself. It's kind of, you know, this this proper pampering, you know, of hair. Like, it's really an experience in and of itself. Whether it it contributes to the end result, yes or no, it doesn't really matter. It's more that moment in that half an hour or 20 minutes that I'm in that chair, that I really feel, okay, someone's really doing something here. It's not just putting your scissors in and off you go. So there's something to be said for, you know, it being more of a pampering service and a feel-good service. And on top of that, of course, that the end result looks nice and that you can go into the world again. Right. And I'm I'm going to make the assumption that when you came in, you felt one way. And when you left, you felt a very different way. And I'm, I'm going to assume you felt good because you told me you got your haircut today. So that, yeah. that says that it's something for you when you left that chair. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. I, 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 there was a moment, you know, let's talk about me for a second here. <laughs> I'm here for you. That's, you know, that's, that's really interesting is that the one thing I, I will say as a hairstylist is that I feel like, you know, we're excellent listeners and that's really yeah. part of our job. So much of what I do is I listen. Um, yeah. In fact, you know, I would say 80%, 90% of my job is listening. And it's not just what you want in your hairstyle, but more so just listening to you speak. And part of it is that emotion. So like you said, let's make it about you. Yes, please. Like, I want you to share with me and tell me. Yeah, no, no, definitely. But but that's really how any hairstylist makes you feel. And it doesn't have to be with language because this morning, the gentleman who cut my hair, he barely spoke English. And that's okay, right? He was a very good hairstylist, but it wasn't his words. It was more kind of what he was doing and how in-depth he was looking at my hair that I would never look at myself. So that's also care. It was it was nonverbal, you know, so it's verbal as well as nonverbal. Exactly. But by the way, what did you kind of specialize in in college? Because you graduated in college as well, right? You have a degree. Sorry, it's different than here in Europe. Uh, so, but, yes, um, I, I yeah. graduated from Boston College um, okay. with a degree in communication and a minor in art history. Okay. And yeah. so I was in, um, when I graduated college, I moved to New York City the day after graduation and I started in, in the garment district. Uh, I was okay. in sales, I was in wholesale, retail. So I just sort of dove into a, a world of, it's funny, my first job was in men's fashion, men's, Perry Ellis menswear. Oh, yeah. And I circle back to years later and now I'm in men's again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so I really found a niche with the boys. <laughs> with the boys, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's uh, yeah. And we're, we're going to talk about that uh, in a minute because yeah, I'm very curious to know the difference between the lady's hairstyle and the men's hairstyle, which is, you know, different for many reasons, but, if, you know, specifically that niche that you found. Um, b- before we do so, I want to go back to that career transition because I think that is, that's really a beautiful story that you basically at age 30 said like, okay, mom, I've done college. I've gotten the six-figure salary, but now I'm going to go for my choice, which is going to be a hairstylist. And then you write, here you are being an intern at a, you know, <laughs> another barber for $6.50 an hour, having to wash hair. So really starting from zero again. 
What was that like? And, yeah. <laughs> financially negative zero. <laughs> yeah, financially, yeah. So in New York City at $12,500 a year is, is almost impossible. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So tell me about that journey and, and specifically the beginning. Like, how did you manage to stick with it, actually? <laughs> you know? Um, so that's, a, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, how I managed to stick with it is just the passion and the drive. I've always sort of had this, and, and again, I really credit this to my parents, this undeniable need to succeed. And I'm not afraid of failures because I fail all the time. Mm. Um, it's just, I, I'm really good at pivoting. And I think that any failure that I have, I just take it as a learning experience and try to find success in other ways. So I think that, you know, that has been like a, a drive for me my entire life is just always wanting to be better in every way possible. Mm. Um, and, and I say, I don't say necessarily the best, but I do, I strive to be the best that I can be. You know, I don't necessarily always judge myself against other people. I just try to say, hey, where is it I can grow to be the best Chris and Serafino? And, you know, also being, I think, older, you know, I needed to be very strategic because I wasn't 18 coming. A lot of hairstylists come out of high school and they go right to being a hairstylist or they go to beauty school or barber school. And, and you know, I had to sort of be very strategic with how was I going to start a career at the age of 30 when most people had 10 years over me? And, yeah. you know... It, it became like, what does that mean to me? Is it that I'm in a salon? Am I a salon manager? Am I educating for brands? Do I have my own brand? Do I go the celebrity route? Am I doing editorial work? I mean, there's so many variables within the hairstyling and barbering world. And, you know, I started at the very um, prestigious Tony and Guy at the time, uh, hair salons. And at the time, Guy Muscola, who's the namesake of Tony and Guy, was in the salon. It was on Madison Avenue and 61st Street. It was their flagship salon in the world. And they pulled together the best of the best within that salon. And as an assistant, I think I had an incredible education. <laughs> I always like to say my education at Tony and Guy as an assistant was harder than Boston College. And yeah. Boston College is a really good school here in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the standard and level of excellence that they required amongst assistants was was, was pretty, pretty tough. But mm. to this day, I mean, I still speak with the, the educators that taught me and I always credit them. You know, one of the greatest things that recently happened to me a few years ago, I was on stage, there was thousands of hairstylists at this show. And I was one of six celebrity hairstylists on a, on a, on a platform, you know, sort of sharing our story. And I was the only female on the stage and on the stage was two other gentlemen who I remember coming up in the business. I used to tear out magazine back, you know, magazines, that's all we had. I would tear out the magazines with their names and be like, one day I hope I'm as good as they are, you know, oh, and here wow. I am on the stage. And I remember being like, I can't believe this has happened to me. So mm. it was one of these moments of like, wow, this is a pretty exciting moment in my career, but also an exciting moment to say that, you know, I had this passion and this drive. I've worked extremely hard. I've had so many just things that just sort of knocked me down along the way. But I always said, nope, I know where I'm going with it. So I think yeah. being that age is what gave me the ability to sort of be more strategic with my career. Yeah. And I really look at it as, as a plus. And I mean, I do, I throw back to my education at BC and my parents all the time. Like it's all the things I've learned along the way. Even my educators at Tony and Guy that were just so hard on me. And I remember crying. I remember this one time. So what you would have to do is learn your haircuts. And then they had a thing called a test out where you would, you would, you know, learn three haircuts, bring the models in on a Sunday, cut them. And then the, the educators would go through the haircuts. I mean, when I say hair by hair, I mean, hair by hair. And they yeah. would give you the opportunity to make the tweaks on the haircut. And if not, then you would decide if you passed it or failed it. And what that meant is you then could become a hairstylist and have a chair and make money, or you would stay at $6.50 an hour. Yeah. And, and the grading system was one to 10. And if you got a six or below, it meant you had to stay an assistant for three more months. Well, again, you know, this is difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're in your chair, you're making money because you're clients. When you're an assistant, you're, you're, you're praying for $5 tips at the shampoo mm. bowl. Yeah. Um, and I remember uh, the gentleman that did my, my haircut, my one haircut. I went back. I made the adjustment. I, I didn't do it right. Um, I made a, a little glitch and, and he failed me by the haircut. And I remember sitting in the office hysterically crying that I had to be an assistant for three more months. But when I look back, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I've never made that mistake again in a haircut. Yeah. Like he made me strive for perfection when it yeah. comes to cutting hair, technically. So it's those moments that I just look back and I say, wow, was he a good teacher? You know, he really, really was. He pushed me at the time where I thought it was just brutal, but wow, I'm here today. And it's funny, he still cuts my hair sometimes. And yeah. I say, 
I sometimes will say to him, remember, you failed me. And he'll say, remember, look where you are. (laughs) So it all worked out. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that there's a lot to be said for this tough love approach, right? Making sure that you get it right and you do it to perfection, specifically if it's it's a business like yours in the in the appearance business and the grooming business, because it needs to look good, right? I was wondering, was it very competitive? What like were there loads of assistants? Is it is it like uh, are, are there loads of people who, of course, want to become that celebrity hairstylist? And therefore, is it very is it is it collegial or is it very like you know I'm on my own and I'm kind of fighting the fight? You know. I've never looked at at what I do as a competitive market. You know, I once had a, a, my old boss, Joe Blackwell, say to me that when a client leaves, it makes room for a new one. So I've never been competitive in any way with what I do. I know that I work extremely hard. I show up on the job always on time. I'm always a professional. I do the best I can every time. So I don't necessarily, you know, people will always ask me, I constantly get hit up on social media or emails, whatever, like, you know, how do I become a celebrity hairstylist? And I'm, I'm always... You know, like, I don't know if there's a, a, a direct line to getting to it. I can only know that my story was that I've always tried to be better every time. I never look at a job. I, I don't ever say the word, I'm a celebrity hairstylist. I'm a hairstylist that works with celebrities. Mm-hmm. I'm very mindful of that. Mm-hmm. And that I show up to my job every day, always trying to be better. So mm-hmm. I think that, you know, competitiveness for me is within myself. And I mean that sincerely. I don't put myself up against anything. In fact, I've had, I'm with an agent that represents me for my my celebrity stuff when I'm working with actors. And I've had other male groomers like myself that I brought onto my agency. And I've had people say, are you crazy? Like they're going to take your work. And I'm like, absolutely not. Like if anything, my friends are going to cover the work if I'm not available. Like we're sharing mm-hmm. it amongst each other. Mm-hmm. And so I don't see it as a competitive industry. I see it as we can all grow together. Mm. And I learn some of the best things that I've ever learned as a hairdresser is when I'm teaching classes, Mm. because someone will ask me something that I'm like, huh, I never thought about that. And it Mm. makes me go back to like the beginning or the basics. And it makes me really think through how I did something or how I achieved something. And this is just more haircutting technical wise. But I mean, that's where I learned the most is from students. Mm So I don't know if that well, answered the question. No, no, <laughs> Sorry. It, it does. It does. I mean, it shows that you, you. It might be competitive, but you were you were focused on your own journey and you did it your way, and that proved to be successful. You know, there might be other people who are very competitive with each other, but you are not, and you're just doing your thing. And I think you're trying to say that being collegial and sharing actually does better things for you than being the opposite and marking your territory all the time. That's not your style, and it you know. It doesn't never make, has yeah. been. Yeah. And I've also, for me, it isn't always about the dollar. Sometimes I think people get caught up in, oh, it's, you know, the instant gratification or it's that Instagram post or, you yeah. know, that moment of like that. Yeah, it's instant gratification. So it's not always yeah. that way. Two things that I, that I had to think of. On one hand, no, of course, it's not instant gratification. But on the other hand, maybe for for your business, whereby it's based on the looks, it needs to look good in a picture or it needs to look good in a shot, which is then very kind of transactional on social media, right? So it needs to kind of, you know, here's your work and that's what it needs to look like. So that might be the instant gratification part of it, but that's all the end result. It doesn't really show the hard work you've put in there no, to get it there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's funny you say that. It's, yeah. I always say to people, the 20 years of me getting to today, it's not just one moment on a red carpet that I did a haircut for and there's my client. It's the suffering and the pain and the hardships and the agonizing and the defeats that have literally gotten to me where I'm I'm standing on a red carpet next to a client with, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of like bulbs flashing. And I say, it is not this moment. It's 20 years of of growing and and learning and educating myself and failures that have made me, I think, where I am today. And even still today, I mean, I can't tell you, I'll do something that's pretty incredible to the outside and I'll look at it and I'll go, oh man, if I would only just done this, or if I'd only tweaked something this way, oh, I could have made it better. But I think that's what makes me grow. And I think, you know, strive to be the best in in this industry. And even, it's funny, (laughs) even for speaking with you this morning, I was so nervous. I get like a stomach ache. I get like the jitters. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years. I still get like so nervous. And so, but I think that's what gives me the edge. And that's what makes me passionate and makes me want to do the best I can for our interview now. 
But yeah. I mean, I'm absolutely no reason to be nervous. But yeah, that's your drive, I think, right? That's kind of what drives you to make it better to, you know, to, as you say, be the best you can be in any situation. Just also reflecting on that and making sure that you you deliver it to that end result that only suits you. So, uh, so yeah, but please don't have any uh, belly ache or anything just, just because of me or don't be nervous because of me because you're doing wonderful. And as I said, you're one of our very coolest guests. So um, very happy <laughs> you, you could make it. Let's talk about the celebrities because I think that glams up your work and you know brings in the glitter and the glam in your job. And I thought it was lovely before I clicked record, you said, I'm not doing any gossip about the celebrities I work with, but just for the listener to understand, you work with actors like Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman. If you look at your Instagram, you know, Serafino says they're like, you know, there isn't a celebrity uh, that you haven't worked with. Um, so who's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I see you. <laughs> well, it is. Uh, my favorite is the client in my chair. Oh, okay. Oh, the very good answer. Very good answer. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, no, but what I was wondering is uh, b- because you said, you know, you said it yourself, it's kind of a niche that you are a celebrity hairstylist. You could also be a very good hairstylist, you know, more traditional sense in New York and, you know, just cut everyone, uh, but going for that celebrity niche. Uh, so first off, how did you get into that? You know, I am... Um Going back to being strategic at Tony and Guy, uh, they had something called the Photographic Awards. This is going back 20 years ago. And as an assistant, I submitted a picture and it was chosen as one of the five finalists. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. I kind of like this idea. And from there, I, I, I mean, just like it, it went back to what I learned being in corporate, like cold calling. I would just research photographers. I would, you know, call up photographers and ask to assist. I would ask to sort of hairdressers. I, I really never went through an apprenticeship program through editorial. I really figured it out on my own. And I would just find photographers. And there was a photographer, his name is Mitchell McCormick. And he, I'll never forget, he looked at my portfolio, which was absolutely horrendous at the time. And he said, give me six months, I'll change your career. And he shot with me for six months. We went to Thailand together. We traveled. We shot celebrities. And under his wing, I mean, another one that educated me in ways of how to behave on set, what to look for in the lens. I always like to say I'm the eyes behind the lens when I'm with a client. I'm their last eyes. So I see everything. And it's my responsibility to make sure that they look and feel their best. But I'm watching for things that no one else is probably looking for. And so it started off with just fashion and beauty photography. And from there, um, one day my mom called and I said, mom, look, I'm in, I, I don't know whether it was like Harper's Bazaar or whatever it was. It was a very small picture. And, uh, and I said, you see my name? And she's like, I can't see it anywhere. And it was in the gutter, which is in the very, you know, fold of the magazine because oh. it was so small. <laughs> and I was like, huh? And she's like, I don't see your name anywhere. And I was like, well, that's a bummer. Yeah. And what I realized at that time is that pretty much everyone that was shooting covers was celebrities. And I said, well, that's sort of what I need to do now. I need to go after celebrities. And I started cold calling publicists. And I can't tell you how many hangups I got where I'd say, hi, my name's Chris and Serafino. I'd like to work with your clients. And they'd say, who do you work with? I'm like, nobody. Click. <laughs> Call me when you have a celebrity. You know? And I'm like, well, God, how do you get to this? Mm-hmm. And at that time, another uh, publicist, uh, Leslie Sloan, who I still to this day work with, and Jeffrey Chasson, gave me my first break. And what they did was they put me on a client. And again, showed up on time, professional, did my best job. You know, I don't gossip. I don't do any right. of that. And I'm here to do a job and get it done. And from there, they just both kept hiring me. And, and you know, I'm always grateful for that happening. But I literally cold called. I mean, that's how I got in front of people. Yeah. And, and it was so many no, no, no's until eventually one says yes. And that's what happened. And then I had how I transitioned to men was I was working with Camilla Alves, who was dating Matthew McConaughey at the time. Mm-hmm. And Pamela De Palma, a publicist, flew me to California to do a photo shoot with, with Camilla. And I was in her bathroom getting her ready. And who walks in but Matthew McConaughey and asked for a haircut. And, uh. you know, I, all right, all right, all right. No, I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, obviously he sat in the chair. And, and the very next week, I was flying to Europe with him. And it, it changed oh, wow. like that, it changed my career. I went from mostly women's hair into men's. Okay. And I, I had the most, we did seven years with Matthew and he went on to shoot the movie that he won the Oscar for. And we kind of lost touch. And just right before the pandemic, I cut his hair again. So, yeah. I mean, I had just a remark. I mean, Matthew, I, I'll always credit Matthew for, for really giving me the opportunity and the chance to, to learn what men's grooming was and, 
And that's sort of where I found my, my niche. And from there, nice. because I, I specialize and it goes back to that toning guy education, I am a really strong hair cutter. Yeah. So I will do haircuts from, you know, what I do with, with actors is that I will set a look for them. So I'll do the haircut before the film, send them off. They'll shoot the film for months at a time. And then when they come back for press, for red carpets, for advertising, that's sort of when I come back again. So, I mean, I've done some, some really exciting haircuts for some clients where I look at the films and I'm like, you know, I don't maintain it throughout the months of shooting, but I'll set the initial look. And I, I think, God, oh, that's pretty cool. Like I came up with that. So that's pretty exciting. Nice. So is there's also someone maintaining it? Because I, I, I mean, it's, it's, oh, yeah, because it needs to all the time look the same and kind of, you know, all those things. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. I'm not in the union and most, most films are union hairstylists. Okay. So yeah. my thing is I usually do it before. Yeah. And then that's when an actor will go off and shoot a film. And there's brilliant, you know, union hairstylists that will every week sometimes they'll have to maintain it for continuity because yeah. films are shot out of sequence. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. That's so interesting. Uh, but again, I think what gave you this success is because you had a strategy, right? So you, you had a plan and of course it, you could have failed, but you, you said like, okay, here's what I'm going to go for. I'm going to go for these photographers going to assist these photographers and these photographers were shooting celebrities and he said, oh, where are the celebrities with publicists? Let me call the publicist. And you kept on calling until you had one. So that's a clear strategy. You weren't shooting for other things. You were just yeah. shooting for those things. And of course it's a high risk because you, you know, all doors could have remained closed, but they didn't. So that, you know, that's a really an amazing story. And then, because I'm wondering like with, like with Matthew McConaughey, Because then it, it doesn't go via the publicist anymore. Because once they say like, okay, this is lovely. We'd love to work with you. Do you come back then to the team all the time? Or how does it work then? Is it, is it so, so how it works is it always goes back, ties back to the publicist. Oh, okay. Because okay. I'm sort of manning the press junkets, the yeah. red carpets, the TV mm. shows. So it really always comes back to the publicist. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so although I, Matthew McConaughey sat in my chair, from there it went to his publicist. And then I was booked. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, there is one thing I, I do want to say, whether it's a celebrity, when anyone's in my chair, I mean, it doesn't matter. Everyone's equal. Hair is just hair for me. And it's always making them feel the best. So whether it's a celebrity, whether it's an executive, whether it's an athlete, whether it's a, a dad, it doesn't matter. You know, yeah. when you're in my chair, it's like I say, it's that magic mirror. We see people in ways that you may not necessarily see themselves. You know, I have this thing when I cut hair where I ask for three haircuts from the first time I cut someone's hair. People have been with me 20 years and I have a consultation every single time you're in my chair. So the first haircut typically is not my haircut. I'm working off someone else's haircut. The second haircut, we sort of work towards a closer variation. And by the third, it becomes more of our haircut together. But I always ask clients to evolve. Yeah. I will never do the same haircut every time because I always say to anyone in my chair, would you wear that same shirt every day for the rest of your life? Yeah. Chances are no. Mm -hmm. So you should always evolve with your hairstyle just like you evolve in life. I really educate my clients on that is that let's do what we're doing today, but that doesn't necessarily, we're going to do that for the fall, for the winter, for the spring, because yeah. seasons change, hairstyles should change. You know, yeah. women, we, we make up, we can change it that way. But for men, it's just the same. It could be a sideburn. It could be facial hair. It could be length. It could be texture. It could be changing your, your product. You know, it, it could be variations of things. There's just always evolving. But that's where you are unique. Because I often challenge If I, you know, if I go to the hairstylist and say, okay, what, what do you think I should do? But they're very hesitant because they say like, well, if I go and do this and you're not happy, you're going to be very upset with me. So loads of people are also very cautious on that level for justifiable reasons because they don't want unhappy customers, right? I think, the, do you recognize that? That people say like, well, no, we're not going to go too short or... And the one thing that I do when I educate, when I educate hairstyles, is I say that, you know, the best thing you can do is listen, right? So if yeah. you said that to me in a chair, what would you do? I would start asking you questions. I yeah. would say, what don't you like? What don't yeah. you like in your hair? Well, yeah. now that's telling you what you don't like. What do you like? What do you like on your, everyone has a facial feature they love, whether it's eyes, whether it's lips, jawline, nose, yeah. cheekbone. So hair is an accessory you wear every day. That so it should yeah. always compliment your face, right? Yeah. So if you think of the ends of hair as arrows and they point towards things. So for women, a fringe is going to bring out the eyes. A bob brings out a jawline, you know, opening a neckline, a little graduation around the neckline elongates the neck. So there are things that the hair can do that can accentuate. It's the same thing for men, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just think it's finding what it is and then bringing out what the client in my chair sees in themselves. And then it's my job to guide them 
not necessarily tell them, but to guide them into hopefully getting to what I see and making that accessory, which is their hair, bring out the features, you know, that make them feel the best. Yeah. Wonderful. (laughs) This is, yeah, no, I'm learning a lot and it's amazing. And it's, I didn't know that, you know, this was how you look at your clients, but you know, you should, because you're right. It's the entire composition that makes the success. It's not the hair in and of itself. It's kind of, okay, what's the look you want to go for? You know, what, what do you want to accentuate of your face? What's important to you? We are proudly supported by Tony's, who have created a product that I absolutely love called Tony Box. It's an audible tool that allows the discovery of our world's most beautiful stories for children of all ages. We are the proud owner of a Tony Box and our three-year-old daughter listens to the Tony stories religiously, whether this is the Gruffalo, Cookie Monster or her all-time favorite Elsa from Frozen. Loads of figurines that fit on the box and loads who are dying to tell you their story. Now, what I particularly love about the Tony box is that there is no screen involved. So you can basically use the box at any moment of the day, just before bedtime or as we do during bath time. Now, Tony's is also making tremendous strides improving their product for teachers from all over the world so they can grow their lessons. And if you want to know more about what Tony's is doing, you can go to us.tonys.com forward slash pages forward slash Tony's hyphen four hyphen teachers. That is forward slash pages forward slash Tony's hyphen four hyphen teachers, where you can find lots more information about all the beautiful new products they are creating. From the classroom starter set to the school expansion pack, to the six pack school bundle. Loads of fun and lots to learn with Tony's. I have two more questions about the celebrity part. One is, again, about the glitter and the glamour. What's the biggest misconception that people might have around being a, a Hollywood hairstylist? Is there something that you say, well, people always think it's like this and it isn't? Yes, it, what it is, it's a job. Yeah. I mean, it's my job. Yeah. And I think that that a lot of times because of like social media or there's the glitz and the glamour and, and you see what was yeah. social media is showing you, but behind it is work. <laughs> yeah. A lot of it, you know, yeah. when I'm traveling with a client and when we're around the world and doing a prep, I mean, with COVID, it slowed down so much. When we were doing world tours, I mean, I could be in a different country every day. Yeah. And, you know, you're talking like one day Taiwan, one day Moscow, one day, you know, Tokyo, one day. I mean, and you're talking about lots of travel and getting off a plane. I mean, uh, during the pandemic, I went to to China for six hours. Oh, so wow. from New York to Alaska, Alaska to Beijing, landed, excuse me, before the pandemic, I should say. Yeah. Uh, landed in Beijing, spent six hours, turned back around and came back. It's not so glamorous. No. <laughs> Exhausting, but you know, I mean, it's it's part of the job, and I'm always just so grateful to be there. Like, it's yeah. an incredible journey to be on. I always say, like, I get to see the world through my clients, and yeah. and I'm blessed and grateful in that way. But it's not my reality, you know. It's no. just part of my job. Yeah. So, and that brings me to the next question: Do you feel that you needed to? Because it's like a pathway, right? You choose the the pathway of okay, you know, working with the celebrities. Therefore, you cannot do. Another element of hairstyling that you might want to focus on as well. It's like you, you know, you cannot be because you also have your own salon. Am I correct? Or you, you, you no, I actually, right now I have my own hair paste. So yes, I have you, my own. Yeah. Oh yeah. So you're, we're going to talk about that in a second, but you also kind of, it's more difficult for you to have your own salon or to work then with a team if you're all the time in a plane, I can imagine. So there no, are certain, all. you'll do it, do it all. Okay. Okay. I do it all. I mean, I've, okay. I'm really, I've found a way and I learned a way to manage time. I work a lot. Sometimes some things slip, not on purpose, but they do. But I try to let the smaller things slip versus the big things. Yeah, I've become pretty good at time management. Um, I think now the focus is my new company called The Best Paste, yes. which is a men's hair place line, which is really my focus. But yeah. everything falls back and leads into it. You know, okay. they all come together. Whether yeah. it's, um, you know, it's the celebrities, which have been, I'm so grateful, you know, Ryan Reynolds has endorsed my product four different times on social media. Like, mm-hmm. that's not something I'd asked for. You know, I've yeah. had like the bigs, Marco Andretti, like I've had a lot of my clients just post about it because one, they've been using it, but it's just that incredible moment where you go, you start, I start crying <laughs> when yeah. I think about like, 
wow, these clients really believe in what I'm doing and believe in the product that, that that's been created. And, and, and it's, it's pretty remarkable. And then, you know, I have the social media element in it, which, you know, I, I'm trying to be better at, but sometimes it's a, it's a very fascinating evolving world that I try to keep up with. I don't always succeed with it. Mm -hmm. um, I try to keep as honest and real about it as possible, but I think there is some sort of fallacies when it comes to social because some things don't seem real. Um, but you know, for me, I try to keep it as real as possible because it's just part of my life. Like there yeah. are times on my social where I'm in my warehouse in Jacksonville, Florida. And when I tell you it's 130 degrees, it's 130 degrees in that warehouse and we are drenched, you yeah. know, that's just, real. <laughs> yeah. you know, and then, yeah. and then there's also, you know, the, the times where, you know, I'll post about where I'm getting to travel some remarkable resort because I'm with a client that's doing a, a junket there. So I, I, there's those elements that I share too. So I try to yeah. keep as real as possible on social. And then I also educate. I go into salons because to me, my happiest place is behind that chair. And yeah. again, like whether you're a celebrity, whatever you do, it doesn't matter. It's my happy place. And yeah. it's where I feel like that's where you're coming to me for my authority. Yeah. And so I, I do get behind the chair and I do have, although I my notoriety is immense, in the salon, I mean, when I am in the salon, I'd say 80% of my clients are females, you mm. know, because I cut oh, hair. Yeah. Yeah. So that's but, an, again, I mean, a different, uh, different style. Let's first talk about the best paste because I watched the video. So the story is there was someone who came up with the paste, with the idea yeah. of the paste. Yes. And he kind of had a, had a secret sauce concept and you really, you very much liked that idea. You guys had been working together for a while and then at a certain point, he says, I want to devote more time to, to my family. And would you want to take over my pace company? Is that correct? You pretty much nailed it. Right. <laughs> um, ben Miller had owned a, a previous company. Um, it was everything from hair paste to shaving to skincare. Um, remarkable line. He had uh, sent me the products um, and through, I mean, I've been using them on my clients. They had traveled, when I say the pace traveled six continents, they've been on every continent when it was Ben's company. And at the point during the pandemic, he got to a place where I think he realized like for so many people, life changed for the pandemic and what became a priority. And I think that he wanted to spend more time with his son, Oliver. And at that point, I think he was ready to sort of shift gears and, you know, approach me to purchase the company and, and never, ever out in my entire career did I want to own a company. I really didn't. It wasn't on my strategy. It wasn't on my list. I always had partnerships with different brands. Mm -hmm. I only speak to brands that I believe in. And again, that goes back to the dollar. Like I've been offered money, but if I don't believe in it, I don't, I won't talk yeah. because my thing is if it goes on my client, it better work because yeah. their brand is their face and their hair. So it, yeah. it better work. Yeah. And so I just never sort of found something that I, I love so much, but I mean, I had given quotes in magazines. I'm very fortunate. I get quoted in magazines a lot. So I would constantly give him because I love the pace so much. And I would just give him, you know, he won awards and he got, you know, his, his pace, I quoted in magazines. And, and so it, it sort of, you know, helped bring recognition and awareness to his brand. And, and I think again, going to the pandemic and life changing and, and the one stipulation was that if I'm going to take over this company and buy this company, that he had to stay with me because he was yeah. such an integral part of the brand. And, and that was sort of the thing. Like, I was like, if I'm going to do this, you got to be, you got to stick with me. And we just, I mean, we're, we really are like brother and sister. We have such an incredible rapport working together. Um, ben mixes it, you know, how we, we've enhanced the formula. So the formulas are the same, but we enhance the product by buying, you know, better raw materials and oil, essential oils. And so it's better consistency. And so it's something that Ben always wanted to do, but didn't necessarily have the resources where I was able to provide that for him. And so, you know, we're working on new things all the time. We have a, uh, uh, we scale back to the five best paste, which is what were the, the core of his brand. Um, and, and that's where we, uh, you know, I decided that that was sort of the way to go because that's what I had used. And mm -hmm. I find that men um, styling product is really what men lead toward. I had done a huge market research uh, before I purchased the company. Um, Crosswalks New York City had provided me with this incredible again, market research on men's hair care. And during the pandemic, when the world was shut down, 6 million men bought hair paste. Hmm. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. And so knowing what I knew, just being a hairstylist and working with men and then having that research sort of to back it up, it just became like, all right, this is the direction to go. So I renamed, rebranded, repackaged, moved the warehouse from Knoxville, Tennessee to Jacksonville, Florida. Mm -hmm. And we hit the ground running in six months. We won uh, men's health, which is considered like one of the 
biggest magazines in the States for men's. We won the best paste in 2022 wow. uh, for men's hair paste with, with, with three months of being launched. We just won, I can't, it's, we're under embargo, but by September, you're here. We just won another huge award coming out. Um, within 38 days of being in business, Saks Fifth Avenue came to us and we now are being sold in Saks a week ago. So we've had this incredible, like <laughs> incredible six months of being in business, but we've been working around the clock. My team is truly phenomenal. Like I could never do this without my team around me. It's yeah. not just me. Like I may be the authority in it because of my job, but I always say it's the people around me. Like I know my strengths, but I sure as heck know my weaknesses. Yeah. <laughs> and they're the ones that sort of make me even. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Doug, who I'm in, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, shout out to Doug. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> in yeah. every way, shape and form. I mean, yeah. I could, I wouldn't be here without him. I'll tell you yeah. that. He is remarkable. <laughs> yeah. No, wonderful. Can you describe to me what it is about the best pace that you like? It's kind of what makes it stand out from all the other pace? Because I assume you you used a lot throughout your career. Why this one? What what makes this one special? You know, one thing was it, it's it's an artisanal brand. It's handmade. We hand make the batches. We, I mean, I do everything from raw materials to finished goods. Hmm. So everything that we do along the way, I love the continuity of it, the consistency. I love the finish. I love the sense. I mean, that really was before I owned the company. I had been using it seven years prior to buying it. Hmm. So, I mean, the belief in this product was long before I owned it. You know, being able to take something that you have such passion about, you know, is exciting. And yeah. to take that from where it was and to be able to take the same team. And again, Ben still works with, I mean, he's still part of this team. Yeah. So to have someone that it was his baby and to take his child, you know, from sort of training wheels. And now we're like, vroom, vroom. We're like, we got some hot rod wheels on now and we're just moving. Yeah. That's so exciting for us. And, and yeah. that's what I, I think I love about it. And it's also, it's like what men want to know is they want to know the finish and they want to know the hold. And yeah. we gave them, I named the product the best paste because it's the best paste I'd ever use. How I categorize it is not by a fancy name like Dragon Fire or anything like that. What I named it was matte and firm hold. It tells you what the finish is and it tells you what the hold is. It's mm -hmm. low shine, it's medium hold. It's natural shine, it's medium hold or firm hold. It's high shine, it's light hold. It tells you exactly what it does. And that's what I learned is men want to know finish and hold. It yeah, does, yeah. It's not without a fancy name. No. So I gave men what they need. I like to say with all due respect, <laughs> Aldo, is men don't know what they need to know until you tell them, especially when it comes to grooming. You know, no, as no. women, we've been lurking for the fountain of youth since birth, which is why we tend to get younger as we age, because we've been relying serums and lotions yeah. and potions. Whereas men will not realize there's a problem until you have an ingrow hair, until your hair is receding, until mm. you're, you're losing your hair. Like, it's fascinating. So once the problem is there... It's like slay the dragon. It's like you have to have a problem and a solution. But really, you want to address the problem before there's a problem. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. we can do that. Men are sort of catching on to it now, which is why in beauty, men's is the fastest growing segment in beauty across the board. Wow. So yeah. really interesting. Yeah. So there's more proactive thinking by yes. men, which opens up an opportunity in the grooming industry yes. for men. More men being on social media, seeing oh, themselves yeah. on or yeah. I think it really put, especially Zoom calls. I mean, we're seeing each other and you're on the other side of the world, but yet, you know, we're looking at each other in different ways and also you're seeing yourself. So yeah. as, as am I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. That's, that could, could be very true. And I, uh, what I wanted to say about the best pace is like when you would ask me kind of what, what does it need to do? Like I, the only thing I could say, it needs to work. And I don't want to put loads and loads of it in my hair for it to kind of ideally last for a day or something, you know, the, the, the longer, the better. And that's all you care for, really, kind of, you know, I, I think maybe men think a lot more straightforward. They need less of the, you know, the coconut scent or I don't know, the, the vanilla style or the, the packaging might be less relevant or, you know, it's a different type of marketing, I can imagine. Completely. And yeah. that's really, I think, where my success is with men is that yeah. my agent always says I speak boy. And I think it's really why he tells me all the time when, when people call for jobs, he's like, no problem. She speaks boy. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. At first I was like, huh? And then I thought, oh, that's a compliment. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but um, I think, and that's where, like I said, you know, going back to, I speak boy is that exactly like you're saying, you just want to know, does it work? Is it matte? Does it hold? Like what's the finish? Yeah. What's the hold? Yeah. And the other thing I find with men is, is most times it's user error. So what I mean by that is application is how men apply. So I'm going to very quickly give you the tips on how to apply products. Cool. And I 
I, this has been probably the most success. I've watched more light bulbs go off when I educate men and even women on how to apply hair paste or our products. All right, are you ready? You ready for your lesson? I am, I am. Here we go. Bring so when on. you apply products, you wanna to apply it to your fingertips, not your palms. Mm -hmm. The reason being is think of your palms as the back of a comb. If you were to take the back of a comb and comb your hair, it wouldn't necessarily do anything but comb the top surface. Mm -hmm. It's the fingers tips, which are the fingers of your comb, think about that, that actually work through the hair. So you wanna apply products in between your fingertips, not the palms. So in between like this, you'll put the products. And then when you want to start from the back forward from the occipital bone above and go forward with your fingers and then go back. If you go straight along the hairline, what happens is you end up having too much product along the hairline. So by coming from back to front, you end up having the right amount to go front to back. And then you can reapply as necessary. And also with hair products, applying hair products to 80% dry hair versus wet hair can change the finish of the, of the product. So if a matte product is applied on wet hair, sometimes it will dry more wet. So you want to apply products 80% dry. Mm -hmm. There you go. This is amazing. <laughs> I've learned so much and, and I've learned that I'm doing it all wrong. That's what I've learned just now. Because when I get the product, I go like this because I read somewhere like yeah, it needs to be like warm and then it needs to go in and then you need to, and then I apply it everywhere. I'm pretty sure I started in front. Well, yeah, and especially, yeah. and I mean, you do, you have such thick, beautiful hair, but for men with recession, the last thing you want to do is apply too much product along the hairline. You want to start more towards the back. So there's my hair tips from Kristen Serafino at The Best Paste. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. Very we'll welcome. be sure to share this far and wide to all our listeners. Thank you so much for these beauty and hair tips. Um, it's such a pleasure talking to you. We could talk for, for three more hours, uh, I think, because there's so much more I want to know about your intriguing life and, and career. And, I'm, you know, people have heard already so much about you, but but for what it's worth, I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll meet success after success after okay. success because I think your strategy is right. And also the way you, you are positioned in it, like as you say, like doors are going to close on you or you might fail, but then you get up and go for the next one and the next one, and the next one until you get it right. So that's really, a, a, you know, kind of a, a wonderful thing and a wonderful mindset to have, Kristen, and really suits you. Thank you so much. Before we close off, and we've been through your three challenges, uh, by the by, we've done it slightly unconventional, but we prepped because you spoke about education, which was one of your challenges. You spoke about starting your career at age 30, um, which, which of course wasn't easy, and then getting yourself, you know, to become the, you know, the hairstylist you are today, which is a tremendous mammoth task. And then, you know, your third challenge was around the company, the best paste, which I'm so happy to hear is, is so successful and so thriving at the moment. And do let me know when it's available in Europe, because, you know, for listeners in other parts of the world, how they can order it, that'd be, of course, be great, because I want to make sure it will be globally distributed, uh, not just well, in the United States. Through Saks.com, uh, they, they distribute globally. So I oh, think okay. I, through Saks. Saks, um, okay. Yes. That is wonderful. So yeah, at the very end, uh, we're at the very end of this interview, uh, Kristen, and thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk to us. Before we close off, I want to ask you uh, three questions that I ask uh, all my guests. And one is around morning routine. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in kind of starting your day right. And I'm doing small investigation among my podcast guests, whether they have a routine as well. Don't worry if not. Um, and you don't have to share your entire morning routine, but maybe, you know, the one thing that you need to do every morning. I, I would be curious if you would want to share. My current routine in the morning is uh, get up in the morning. I make matcha tea. That's my, my routine. Uh, watch the first five to 10 minutes of news. And from there, sort of sit down and um, either we sit on the balcony and sort of plan out what the day is going to look like. And that's kind of the routine. My workout will come sometimes morning, sometimes later in the afternoon, depending on my schedule. But it always begins with uh, the news, uh, matcha tea. And then my man and I, we sit down and we always sort of do a little recap on what the day looks like. And nice. we always, we do this thing where we kind of always, I would, I don't know what's called a gratefulness, but we always sort of take in a, a moment to sort of appreciate everything that's happening in our life. So Nice. Nice. And I are you... 
Are, are you a morning person or are you, do you, do you know, or are you an evening person? Well, I'm both. I mean, this sounds We're ridiculous both, yeah. I think yeah. because I am, um, uh, because of everything that happens in my life with work and, and life that I, I don't sleep much. I think morning, night, it, it, I'm always happy. I really do. My mom's always said that even as a baby, like I always just woke up happy okay. and I just <laughs> continue to just, you know, my man will say when I wake up in the morning, I wake up with a smile and I don't even know I do it. So I just think that's just my personality and who I am. And so I kind of always do smile. <laughs> nice. Yes, you do. That's really, yeah. that's really true. <laughs> like you're all the time smiling and you must make so many others happy with that attitude as well. I can imagine because it, it must be contagious. Um, the second question is uh, around uh, reading. So has there been any kind of reading that inspired you throughout your career? And if so, would you care to share it with our, our listeners? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So I go through phases of reading. I'm kind of into comic books. <laughs> so I'm in a comic book phase right now. And I, I think it's just because it's very, um, you know, it's easy to kind of just, it's mindless in a way and there's pictures and it's, it's because my life is so intense in so many ways. I find it a really good escape for me right now. Mm. Um, I do read a lot of trade publications. So as far as, is there one book or two that's really sort of inspired me? Um, I love who moved my cheese. So oh. that's one of the books I've always loved. It's so simple on life, but it's just, it was one of those things that just, it kind of resonated for me. And I just, I've always liked the book. I've loved nice. it. And we're going to find out um, more about the book because we're going to do a, a list of recommended reading on, on the basis of our guests you know, further down the road. And then the very last question. Now let's turn the tables. This is no longer the Teach Fish podcast. This is the Kristen Serafino podcast. Oh. Who is highest on your guest list? Who would be your very first guest that you would want to talk to? And it could be anyone, oh. dead or alive. Oh, okay, dead or alive. I yeah. love Muhammad Ali. Huh? So... He would be on the top of my list. Hmm. I just, I find him to be fascinating, his entire story. And again, it goes back to sort of being, I love athletes. So Muhammad Ali is always one of the ones that I would interview. Um, another one is one of my clients, um, Michael J. Fox. He is hmm. probably one of the, I, I call him the love of my life. I just love him so much. I find hmm. him to be one of the most inspiring people I've ever worked with. Um, you know, he, he, he has Parkinson's and I just, I just find him remarkable. So I love his story. I mean, I've been on, Oh, I can't even tell you how many interviews I've been on, but there's so many times there's always like, I want to ask a question. So he would be on my, the top of my list. I think of people I'd love to interview. Um, I'd like to interview you. And why? Yeah, what? <laughs> because I, I've listened to so many of your podcasts and I find it fascinating. Um, and I'd love to learn sort of how you go about your process of interviewing because I, I mean, part of my job is interviewing. I have to listen to people. I have to mm -hmm. learn ask the right questions to get what I need. So I would love to just sit down with you and just honestly interview you. <laughs> Let's set it up. Let's set it up and all of the above. And thank you. It's a big compliment. You want to talk to me. And I mean, the, the process is it's, it's been a journey. We set out a strategy to say, okay, we want to get, you know, we want to invite people who are successful in what they're doing. And, you know, that people want to kind of lean into kind of how did you realize this? And at the same time, we want to highlight what their challenges were, because we didn't want it to come across, as you say, like instant gratification. We really wanted to amplify the message that it doesn't come easy. These are like 10 plus years or 20 years in, in investments that you make to build up a career, you know, whether this is a company or whether this is, you know, writing a book or whether, you know, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, being a trauma surgeon or a space lawyer or kind of, you know, all the professions that we've had in our podcast. It's, you know, everyone has the same message, like it's hard work. And some people say, I've been lucky, I've been fortunate, like you said, like I've been fortunate of, you know, being able to work with, with very good people and having good mentors and teachers and whatever. But it all comes down to the same message, like it's hard work and you need to put yourself out there to make it a success. And that's in essence what this podcast is about. And I, I so love that whoever I speak to kind of says the same thing, always in a different way. But that's that's bottom line where you know, what I'm proud of that we've given life to now, episode 54 already. So 54 episodes in and going strong. So. And you should be very proud. It really, it really is. It's, it's, uh, and I, I really mean it sincerely. I'm very honored to be on and speaking with you and 
you know, and, and like, I do like, I want to like encourage anyone and, and I'm very much, whether it's a stylist or, hair, you know, barber or, or anyone that they can always reach out to me. I'm, I'm an open book and, and whether it's through social media, I try to engage with whoever possible because I think there's no question is a bad question. You know, yeah. it's, it just helps me to be a better person. So yeah. I really do. I, I'm, thank you so much for having me all. This has been such a great experience. The pleasure and the honor was all mine. Thank you so much, Kristen, for, for joining us uh, in this episode. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about you. We'll, we'll put on your, your, your Serafino Says, that's your handle, I know, <laughs> on Instagram. So follow uh, Kristen there. And if you don't remember, check out our show notes. We will be sure to mention everything about Kristen and her great new product, The Best Paste. And at the best paste is also the other handle. At the best paste. Okay. And um, I'll be sure to apply uh, my hair products now in the right way. Thank you for for guiding me through this, Kristen. Uh, It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Again, I appreciate you. Have a wonderful evening. Take care. If you liked this episode of the Teach Pitch podcast, then it would mean the absolute world if you could share it with your friends and or give it a short review on your preferred podcast platform. The more you share your ideas about these interviews, the more people will find out about them. So do let us know what you think. We'd be very, very grateful. Special thanks to Philip Anderson for our beautiful theme music. This podcast was produced and edited by Natalie Piles. Project coordination by Inva Saini and production assistance by Genta Metalia.